Good morning and welcome to Books and Beverages. My name is Jed Williams and today I have the honour to inter interview or listen to John Mason, who is a, a crime author. Good evening or good afternoon. Yes, John, your first novel was The Blooding of Brian Blake. Yes. Can you give us a short passage out, out of the book or chapter or whatever you want to do so people get a feel for the book without giving the plot away, obviously? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll go to chapter 21. <clears throat> Ready. Sunday, 7th of July, two weeks after the murder. Not that I needed an excuse, but I left home early to get some more studying in a panel. My superhawk ate the miles. After the rain, it was fine with a strong wind and scudding clouds. A steady 50. Admiring the countryside, Harewood Bank, crossed the wharf, past the turn off to Dunkeswick. Now the gentle climb towards Harrogate. About three quarters of a mile shy of the junction with the A658 Bradford Road, I became aware of a high-pitched motorcycle engine closing from the rear. Seconds later, a maroon Honda Bendley, my bike's smaller cousins, it passed. The rider too slim to be anything but female. Dark, close-fitting, red leathers, low of the tank. She lifted a hand in acknowledgement and that raised a smile. I tweaked a little more from mine, closing the gap. 200 yards ahead, the road swung to the left between embankments and high hedges. There was no cross view. She used to 40 miles an hour. I followed. Barely visible coming round the bend at about 50 miles an hour was a farm tractor towing a, tra a, a trailer laden with several tons of potatoes. The world slowed to time lapse as a red MGA appeared, overtaking the tractor, travelling at, I guess, 60 miles an hour blocking the road, a closing speed of 50 yards per second the driver laughing over his shoulder, the front near sight passenger kneeling and half turning to his right, giving two fingers to whatever was behind, both oblivious to what was happening in front. The tractor driver, in all probability, couldn't hear the thing because of the noise and didn't appear to have seen the bike. A hand-cranked motion picture, frame by frame, except I wasn't a member of an audience, I was an actor, my view crystal clear. The result inexorable. How bad was it about to become? Frame by frame, yard by yard, the participants, participants closed. The motorcyclist swung her bike to the right to rip the throttle open in an attempt to get out of the way of the MG and the tractor sedate progression of 24 feet per second. A collection with the hedgerow, a collision with the hedgerow preferable to the alternative. A double mount police car appeared behind the MG. I swung across to the offside, dropped the anchor and the brake. I've never felt so helpless. Too late. The MG driver looked to his front, for the first time aware of what was happening. In horror, wrenched the wheel to the right as it struck the rear wheel of the bike and reared up the bank, rolling over before sliding down and across the road, both occupants trapped. I watched the signal. The bike spun 180 degrees and disappeared beneath the tractor. The driver stood on the brakes and buried both bike and rider. The motion picture stopped. Total silence. All hell broke loose. Right, come on, carry on. I was enjoying that. I was <laughs> way in a trance there. Um, that's that's really, really, really good because you're wondering what's going to happen next. You know where 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 that leads to. Yep. Right. I, I know. I noticed by reading one of your novels that they're set in nineteen sixties. Yes. Did you choose? Did you choose that time for a reason? You know. Personal experience, it was it cost us no DNA and pace at that time. <laughs> uh, your investigation. Uh, well, DNA was only a pipe dream, and pace that was a disaster. That was well, I won't say a disaster, but that was about to come along in 1984. But no, it's my era. I joined the police, I straight I joined the police cadet straight from grammar school. I went to King James's grammar school at Oldenbury in Huddersfield. Uh, I joined the police cadets in 1962. Um, and basically, that's just a uh, you had the same powers as a civilian, but you wore a police uniform. You worked in offices, uh, answered the telephone. You learnt about the structure of the police force and roughly how it worked. Uh, I joined the regular force in um, March 1965, and I was stationed in, or I was sent to Padlash, the number three district police training centre at Harrogate. And on the front of the blooming of Brian Blake, that is the photograph taken of the buildings 
of the main building. The bit in the middle is the original mansion dated in the last quarter of the 18th century. The bits either side um, were added on much later and it is much larger than it appears there. Um, and the book is set, the, the, back, uh, or the, the backdrop for this book is in fact Pan Lash um, with some of the action taking place in the Valley Gardens, which most people know, uh, and at Boston Spa and at Tatcaster and Huddersfield. He, he lived in Solidine Nook, Huddersfield, did, did Brian Blake. But it, it was it was that era. It was the day, era before the computer chip was dreamt about. So there were no personal radios, no smartphones. Um, the, the the only equipment that we had apart from a whistle was one of these, that, uh, which which did come in handy from time to time. Just a piece of wood. This is quite light. Uh, still hurt if you got hit with it. Um, and a pair of these. Uh, and these are Victorian, not the pair that I use. These were a, a gift from a neighbour whose father had been in uh, the police in the uh, 19th century. Um, they, 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 when I joined, they gave me those. But but it, it's about uh, my era. Uh, and I can still remember some of the incidents that happened to me as a young probationer. Um, and I probably couldn't remember where I from a tea last night. You know. uh, one in particular... One in particular, when you were working what they call Town Beat One, which was a with town centre, and I worked at Cleckheaton. Uh, in my books, it's 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 called Westley. But one of your duties, especially uh, after meal, when there weren't many people about, or shouldn't have been many people about, you would check all the property. You would check the front doors, and where possible, you'd check the rear doors. And one of the pr uh, premises that we had to check was the offices of the Spember Guardian the local newspaper uh, and you just walk up the hill two steps you would jump onto the top step grasp, grasp the, the <coughs> excuse me, grasp the door handle turn it hit it with your shoulder and bounce straight off it was one movement except one night i jumped onto the top step turned the handle hit it with my shoulder and the door opened and i was flat on my back looking up at the ceiling wondering what's going to happen so uh no radio um, it was no good blowing the whistle because there was no other policeman about. The nearest one was in the office. Um, so it's into the office, a quick check, make sure that there was nobody hiding under the desk, you know, nothing broken, uh, and ring up and get the keyhole out. Um, but that's that's the way it was. You know, if you were on your own. Um, thankfully, it was a much less violent society. Um, another one, uh, I was checking property. Um, this was about 11 o'clock at night when the pubs were turning out and just off the off Northcote in Cleck Eaton um, there's a ginnel that runs down to Bradford Road and there were a couple of warehouses but I could hear a, a large crowd um, which was unusual and I, I got to the bottom I was 19 at the time or maybe just 20 the whole of Bradford Road was blocked there must have been 40, 50 people in a ring, no traffic could get through, and in the middle, there's two blokes sparring up. So my options were, A, push my way through and find out what was happening, or go back to the telephone kiosk about 100 yards behind. Um, I hadn't made my mind up when somebody turned around and says, hey, up the coppers are here. So uh, I had to go forward, and they kept me back just long enough for the two uh, protagonists, antagonists, what you like to, to disperse. So when I got to the middle, there was nothing to see and the crowd dispersed. But that's the sort of thing that you could be faced with at any time. It, it was a different environment altogether. Um, does this come across in the books, does it? Um, How different it was in those days? Oh, yes, yes. It's, it's, uh, it's, as it, it's, it's society as I saw it from the inside looking out. Um, yeah, I understand the, that. Yeah, the police were insular. They had to be. They had to be separate, yet part of community. So, uh, and you wore a uniform for a reason. Um, so people could recognise you. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's about... It, it's... We don't operate in a vacuum. Uh, it, it, that's as it was. You know, you, you, I write as I saw as a police officer. Um, 
it, it does get a bit more interesting in places, but, uh, but, but yeah, that's... Uh, do, do you embellish it to, over the top of those little incidents, you know, uh, make them more exciting than they actually were? Those two particular incidents are, are, are involved, but, yeah, you, 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 you're trying to weave a story. You're trying to get people to suspend their reality and join yours. Uh, yes, you've got to make it exciting without being um, overly dramatic. But, yeah, you've got to do that. It, it, do you think DNA and PACE have, have spoiled that for modern-day policemen to write their stories? They've changed things. Um, the, um, the computer chip has, has changed the world. Uh, it, it's a totally different ball game these days, and I don't know if I would like it or not. Uh, the only people who had heard of DNA were, were, the, were the academics. Uh, what we call DNA was discovered by a, a Swiss scientist in 1860-something. It was 1853 before Watson and Crick, I think they were at Oxford University, discovered the, its helical structure. But the first conviction was uh, a gentleman called Pitchfork, I think, uh, for the murder of two girls at Narbury, in Leicestershire. Uh, and that was the first time that... Um, DNA analysis was used in anger, so to speak. Uh, and it took a long, long time. Now it can be done in minutes. Then it took weeks. Um, but How would Brian Blake have, have, have adapted to that? Well, he's, in, he's, in, he's far more intelligent than I, than I am. Um, <laughs> yeah, he left university with a, a degree in sports science and anatomy. So he's a very clever lad. Um, he probably would, uh, but um, but me at my age, no, I wouldn't. But uh, it's uh, um, as far as pace is I'm concerned. I'm just asking for the future future books that uh, you may have to incorporate this later later on in your your series. Um, I know quite a lot of people I can ask, but but basic, <laughs> but basic police policing the interaction between uh, the police and non police officers. Is, is enhanced by uh, computers. It also aids the aids the criminal uh, with communications. But uh, but no, but but the system as we operated in those days, uh, assuming that someone had been taken into custody, uh, and and in small police stations uh, in the old West Riding, either had no cells or one cell, um, and and. People would report it for summons unless it was absolutely essential. Um, they, the people who were in custody, they could be cautioned, uh, bailed to return to the police station pending further inquiries, could be bailed to court or kept for the magistrates to decide that where the magistrates acted almost as a, an, in, an independent tribunal when the police put a prisoner before them saying, this man is in custody for X. We believe it, should, it, 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 it would be safer and better for society if he were remanded in custody. And then the defence would have their say, well, we disagree, yeah, he, he has a home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is the first offence, et cetera. Um, and we think he should receive bail. And that independence of the magistrates was vital uh, in the judicial process. One of the things that Pace did uh, admittedly that was from 1984 5 onwards was it changed the balance because prisoners who were in police custody had an automatic right to be bailed unless the circumstances were such it was, a, you know, it was murder or, or, or some of the very serious events um, and so that independent element was taken out um, and that was down to a gentleman that you may have heard of called Keir Starmer. Uh, to, I think we all know him. Um, but there were other things like when somebody was arrested, you might have had a, say, a, a ram raid at, a, at the jewellers. Uh, you have one man in custody, but you want the other one. Ideally, you would interview that man in custody as soon as possible to find out what he knew or what he was prepared to say. Now we can say, I'm saying nothing until I get my solicitor. Now that could be two hours. So that's two hours you've lost, all because of, of pace. Now, there were one or two good things in it. It, it, it did um, 
sort of codify what custody officers were supposed to do, gave them legal powers. Um, but it's the, the balance was changed more to the rights of the criminal than the rights of the victim. And, and that is something I still have trouble with, that, that the criminals get more rights than... Uh, so at least in your book, you're not having to deal with that, are you? No, that, that. no, it's, it's much, it, it's the system I grew up with. Uh, a lot of the law we had was Victorian. <laughs> so so uh, it's all changed by now, but you know, those, those, those were the days, my friend. A lot, a lot, a lot of authors spend a lot of time with it in, in, in the interview room, um, which has changed dramatically over the years, as, as you well know. How, how does your uh, protagonist deal with this? Do you get them over the desk, or does he uh, chat to them nicely? No, I, I don't have them. I haven't found any. any you know, if you have the evidence to put before people, um, they can either answer it or not. Uh, and in those days, if people refused to comment, you would make a note of it. Not just as a no comment, but you know, I was given the opportunity to answer the question, but refused to put his point of view. Um, uh, you, ov you obviously can't write where, if you, if you have the information, the evidence or, or to, to put before somebody, uh, th that's one thing. If you haven't, then in those days, uh, unless somebody applied for a writ of habeas corpus who was to pr produce the body, you could keep people in custody until the cows came home. Um, not that it's good for the story, because you want your story to, to have some fun. Move on, yeah. yes. But it's, uh, but yeah, it's uh, people could be kept in custody, uh, which is not one of the better things probably about Pace, but it does severely time limit um, policing investigations. But you still have the 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 option to go before the magistrates and seek an extension provided you give right the reason it will be granted do, do, do your books stand alone or do you have to read them as part of the series uh, what your first book would, would them, or the second book would they be able to read it on its own yes to yes to both they are standalone stories but they are overlaps because it's a story it's a story of a young man who comes from university joins the police force following in his father's footsteps uh, the first novel, The Blooding of Brian Blake, takes place in his um, stay at Number 3 District Police Training Centre. The second book, Nemesis, is when he goes on the beat, and that is followed by Counting the Dead, which takes him up to the end of his probationary period. So they are all separate stories, but there are links between each one. Uh, is there a fourth one planned? Um, yes. I was hoping that would be out on the 1st of July, but it's not. Uh, it came back from the editor saying, just a minute, uh, and it's, I'm still working on it. Um, it's, uh, <clears throat> And that's my own fault for not checking. If I checked what he found, then I wouldn't have sent it to him in the first place. But uh, yes, it's... it's a life of an author, that, isn't it? Well, it is, yeah. It's, uh, uh, But it, you, you, you have to get an independent check. Um, otherwise... If I'd have published this without having it edited, it would have been a disaster. But all the problems have, have now been erased and it's undergoing its final checks. Hopefully, uh, I'd like to get it out within the next three weeks. But uh, and what, what will that be called? Um, or has it only got a working title? Oh, no, no. Death in the Slush Pile. Oh, right. That's Death in the Slush Pile. I tried to research that one. Yeah. Now I know why I couldn't. <laughs> yeah, Slush Pile... Uh, is uh, a term used by literary agents um, when they receive uh, unsolicited uh, submissions from would-be authors. Um, and it's basically a query letter explaining what it's all about, a synopsis, maybe as little as 300 words about the book, and a specimen number of chapters. Now, death in the slush bile can be either a document which never gets out of the slush pile, in other words, it dies in the slush pile, or there's something in the documents which lead to murder. Um, so you can make your own mind up. But that's that's the story. See, see if I'd, I'd been given that title, I'd have thought, you found the body in the slush pile. <laughs> no, that's, you know, that, that's me. No, you, find that that in the, you might find that in an abattoir, but... Uh... <laughs> right. <laughs> But no, slush bottle is just a pile of paper.
Do, do, do you like to write it as a sequence then rather than individual novels? Yeah, my trigger for writing was re actually reading Fifty Shades of Grey. Now, no, nobody's, nobody's ever read Fifty Shades of Grey and I read it all the way through and said, by God, that's a good story. It's about kinky sex. Um, I, I, and I thought, well, well, my version of it will is not, I'm not into sadomasochism, um, we'll never see the light of day. And the two World War II novels that followed are still incomplete. And then I had the idea, well, why not write about something you know and understand? Not that I didn't like the research I had to do for the others, but the, um, but, you know, so that's why I picked that. And I wanted to be different in that everybody seems to write about experienced detectives, experienced police officers. And quite often you've got the Veras, you've got the Banks, you've got the DL and Pasco, you've got Morse and Endeavour. So I decided to go one step further and apparently no one has ever thought of doing it before. Um, and that was to start from the first day of a policeman's career, which is why I started with Brian Blake going to Palm Lash. Because it, it's the same brain we've got that we had 200,000 years ago. It's a Mark 1 human brain. On the only difference between a brand new raw recruit and a, a detective chief inspector is age, experience and knowledge and probably that the chief inspector uh, gets more letters from his ex-wife solicitor than a raw recruit and is and is nearer to becoming an alcoholic. But, uh, but the, but, the but probably Nathan. But, <laughs> but, well, yeah, but the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the policeman, all he lacks his experience, he's still got to know the difference. Basically, it's a, a wanting to do the job that he thinks the police should do uh, and 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 learn to think. You just don't know uh, the system, and you don't know the law, and and you don't have the experience. And that's so Blake. St Blake stick by the system, then does he? He never goes outside of the rules. Um, not really. No, he's he's a good. He, I would say he's a good. He's good. He's he's not. But um, <clears throat> he, uh, he. I wouldn't work. You know, it, I know a lot of people say, well, rules are there to be broken. Well, rules are there to look after you. To, to, you know, once you start and break the rules, it's a bit like telling a lie. You've got to have a damn good memory. You start telling lies and you don't have a good memory, you're going to get caught out. If you stick to the truth, then it's what if it's what happened. And that's why I've tried to write it. Um, <clears throat> his, uh, his weakness, if anything, uh, is the memory... Of his father, the fact that his his mother had to remarry or didn't have to remarry, but she, she, he's got a stepfather. His father was a police officer who was killed, who was murdered, and that is the baggage that he carries with him. You know, what can I? Am I big enough to fill my father's boots? Uh, what would my father have done in these circumstances? His father was a detective, uh, detective sergeant. So, uh, what would my father have done? How would how would he have looked at it? You know, what decisions would he have made? Uh, and basically, all he can do then is is, is think, uh, and and then make his own decisions. And if he's right, he's right. If he's not, he's not. Um, and and basically, it's just. I suppose you could say. Uh, the first novel is, is is a coming of age story. You know, the blooding is a term from fox hunting. Uh, you know, your first offence, uh, the first kill, you get a youngster there, sometimes the first hunt. They cut the tail off the fox and then do blood on the cheeks or on the forehead. That that is blooding. So the blooding refers to what happened to him at Pan Lash. And he had a, a far more energetic time, a far more interesting time than any of the policemen I've ever met at, uh, or ever likely to meet. At, uh, at least the policemen. Training, had... is, a, tra training is quite boring if, if, if only people knew, isn't it? Uh, yeah. It, uh, as a lot of policemen who've read my books have said at least you got the, the, the procedure right. They might not like the stories, but at least the procedure's right. But the uh... I was going to ask you that about procedure, whether you stick rigidly to procedure, because it can kill a book, can't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. It can make it as well, of course. Fun. It, it can either kill it or make it the procedure, can't well, it? Yes. Um, yeah, there's things like um, taking fingerprints. You, know, you quite often see them just dabbing the fingers and transferring. Well, that... It, it, that Taking fingerprints is a skilled job. If you don't get enough on, on, 
uh, ink on the on the uh, on the on the metal on the on the board, then you don't get an imprint. If you get too much, when you get a smudge. You also roll the finger uh, mm -hmm. because a fingerprint on a fingerprint form is square, rectangular. Well, rectangular. Um, do you think, do you think there's a book in this of writing about what police procedure really is, so that other authors can look at it? Uh, the Gothery. There's a lot of those already about, but yeah, it's it's possible. Yeah, you know, things like uh, you get in in somewhere. Um, some chief inspector is saying, "I'm charging you with this." Well, no, you're not. The charge sheet is when when a person is charged is the document that ends the police investigation and is the basis for the court proceedings. Because that's what they work for, so um, uh, it's 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 a definite procedure. You, if you without the charge sheet, then you don't have a court case. Uh, so you've got you've got to get. And when people are bailed, it's the same procedure. When people are bailed, it's not unbailing you to so and so. It's sign this form, and you give them the copy, so they know there's no excuse for not attending because they've got a written record of who they are and when they have to reappear. So uh, <clears throat> it's it's making sure that the the basic stuff is is correct because if there's no big you know if it's not there and if they, they, you know you get the people saying get an express message out but it's not as simple as that but uh, then it, it's good television but uh, it's um, it, it, there is a set procedure for doing that it's not arduous yeah, but you've, you've already gone into a little bit about what I was going to ask you now about uh, what inspired you to write novels that's Fifty Shades of Grey and uh, your, your own experience as a background, but are there, are there any other places you get your ideas from? Uh, yes, they like are. Like indoors, for instance. <laughs> well, from people in general, um, the the actual idea for um, death in the slush pile came from a photograph from a murder of a murder victim from the nineteen twenties or thirties. Not, I, I saw the photograph when I was seventeen and as a police cadet. Um, and it's uh, a man who's naked from the waist down. He's in a semi derelict house, propped up against the door frame, and his penis has been cut off and stuck in his mouth. Uh, and and that's the photograph. And that's all there is, uh, mind you. That's the sort of thing that gets passed around amongst teenagers. And people go and say, "Well, I got that. I bet that hurt." But the um, but that's where the idea f came from for death in the slush pile, without giving too much away. But, uh, but, yeah, so it, you have a, a driver for every one of your books, do you think? A what, sorry? A driver, you know, so, some, some incident that helps each of the books along. Yeah. You know, like, like that one for that, or uh, they, they recruit uh, at uh, in West Yorkshire or whatever, you know, do you always have a driver? There's usually a basic idea. that I, I'm the sort of writer that, that doesn't plan. You know, they call them pants, that you fly by the seat of your pants. You basically get a, an idea, and and you you, you try you you work with the idea, um, and if it works, it works. Or you know you think well, it's a good idea. I've got to you know, I've got to find something to make it work, and and basically it was the whole of definitely the slush pile is built around um, that sort of in, that that photograph. Um, <laughs> the uh, def, uh, the building of Brian Blake is built around is. Special uh, his, his stay at at Panlash, <clears throat> and the other two, um, Nemesis, is uh, not built around anything. Is is built around uh, an incident that I started to write about, and I've just taken that one thread and built the story around that. <clears throat> and uh, counting the dead, which is the the, the, the third novel. Um, is about an incident which happened. So you you, you you find an incident and you, you decide to build it on that, if it's viable. And the way I look at it is, is this the sort of thing that the police would get involved in? If not, then it's it, it's a, a, a distraction. But, um, but if it, it is, it's how can I make it work? And there are times when you find out that the story is taking you away from where you want to go. So you you get rid of the <clears throat> these extraneous words. But uh, the one that follows Death in the Slush Pile, um, he's a sergeant. Um, and you know, the, so, so that's in the planning stage, is it the next one? 
it's partially written. It's partially written. <clears throat> about, about, I've got about 20,000 words. So my, my way of dealing with writer's block is to start a new story. It, uh, so if I get something and I can't get past it or I need to change, I'll change the I'll, I'll change the story. So it, so it's I'm looking at something completely fresh. But the uh, excuse me. Do you think that comes from your experience of being able to go back and thinking, well, that one doesn't work, but I'll try this. Yeah, um, I have quite a broad experience, like most police officers. Uh, apart from beat work, I spent five years as one of those those night road traffic police officers. Uh, I went from there into the force control room, um, where I learned radio skills, and the police national computer just started in those days, so I learned that. We also dealt with all motorway breakdowns. And after two years there, I was promoted and sent to Bradford. Um, it's quite funny because I mentioned about police officers uh, in police stations, some police stations in, in West Riding, they didn't have many cells. And because they didn't take many prisoners, the force in general were known as Gurkhas because they took no prisoners. They looked for ways of dealing with someone. So when I went to Bradford, their call sign at Bradford City was XB. I became XB Gurkha One. That that was it. Was it was it wasn't vicious. It was it was said in, in good fun. So you either take it in good fun or you upset you upset people. So uh, and yeah, you know, once you're seen, you've got a sense of humour and you're user friendly, then you get along well. You've got to give and take. But uh, yeah, it, it's um, you, it, you are looking for. You get experience. That gave me a lot of experience. Of working in an inner city, a large city, um, and uh, where there's something I hadn't had before, and from there I was seconded to the because I've been on traffic medications. I was seconded to the uh, the computer unit who were developing with Ferranti International when it existed um, what is known as the command and control system, which is uh, we were level we were phase four, which is nothing to do with Big Brother. It, it's um, a recording, uh, an incident recording resource deployment handling program, which is now basically nationwide with a, 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 an analysis program bolted on the back because you've got a huge amount of information on these police messages. You can't interrogate paper. If it's on a computer, it can be interrogated and you can find out things. You can look for patterns, which is what, the, the, what it is. And from there, uh, we set up the conditions communication training wing and then they sent me to they said you can go wherever you, wherever, wherever you want just name your subdivision so i said well i'll go anywhere apart from holbeck so i spent my last 10 years as a police officer at holbeck as a patrol sergeant <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah uh, three years on patrol hey, we've all been years, there <laughs> three years as a, a custody officer and the last four years as the station sergeant so i looked at the 29 years I've got, and um, it, it's all the stuff, that, all the everything that you need, or everything that I need, is there. All I've got to do is to remember it. Um, some bad, some good, some indifferent. But, uh, but yeah, it's uh, that's, that's where I get my ideas from. But, Can you see you writing anything other than crime? Uh, yes, I would like to. I was talking to uh, an editor, in fact, the gentleman who edited uh, Death in the Slush Pile, and he specialises in World War Two, and I've got two World War Two um, manuscripts, um, uh, and he sounded, especially the one which which is about in espionage and counter espionage. Um, he thought that sounded fascinating, so he wants to see that one, but uh, it's only half finished. But so, but yeah, if I live long enough, yes. We've all, we've all got, we're, we're at an age where uh, you begin to sense your, you've got the sense of your own mortality. But, uh, <laughs> but, I know someone will finish your book off, haven't you? <laughs> uh, before it finishes me off. But uh, yeah. not not like Freddie Mercury singing, Who Wants to Live Forever? Well, I'd like to manage a bit longer, but uh, it's... Uh, have you got anything else you'd like like to tell the the audience um, about yourself and your book before we finish? Uh, I don't know. I think it's skin most of it. Um, it's, I just hope they buy it and enjoy it. That uh, oh, there's a um, give yourself a plug of where they can get it from. Uh, well, they get it from uh, 
Well, every, any any event that I'm at, I'm at. Uh, if you're anywhere near Denbydale on the 2nd of November, there's a book fair there. You'll find me there uh, from One Well Four. Uh, there's a, a, a Supporting Yorkshire Authors book fair in the Ridings in Wakefield on the 7th of December. I'll be one of the 30 Yorkshire authors that are there. Uh, they're all available if you from any from Amazon, um, from any online platform for ebooks, uh, for print, um, and if enough people ask for them, I know they're in at least two libraries. They're in Wakefield Library and they're in Harrogate Library, the main library at Harrogate, um, and I'm sort of touting round trying to get other libraries to take them on. Uh, to, so if they become, and I know that, that Harrogate, my daughter sent me a photograph of death of uh, the bloody of Brian Blake in the returned books section. So obviously, uh, the library have, have lent it out at least once. Um, so, um, but yeah, it can be available. And it wasn't me. <laughs> uh, oh right. Well, no, you've got your own copy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the. Uh, but no, it's it's available. Are you widely are you widely available if uh, people want to look look for the titles? Yeah, and if they get if you go on to if, if they want the ISBN number, the International Standard Book Number, uh, if they go on to uh, Amazon, if they don't want to get it from Amazon, they will find the AS, ISBN number uh, with the book, so they can go into Waterson's or any other bookshop and say, "Can you get me a copy of this book?" And they can because the printers for mine are. Uh, the ones that supply the bookstores and the libraries, so it's uh, it's possible to get it. It's very well, very widely available if people want to know. That's, uh, I've really enjoyed this uh, conversation this morning, and hopefully, when when the book comes out, we can have another chat. And with, uh, with the greatest of pleasure. And hopefully, a lot of people watch this on YouTube and buy buy your three three other books and anything else you've written. Yes, that would be even better. Good. Right. But thank you. Thank you, John. You're and welcome. talk to you soon. Take care.